morning. Good morning. Good evening, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll just wait a few minutes until uh, Quentin joins. Fine with me. Good morning, or afternoon, as it may be. <laughs> Good morning, or afternoon, or even evening. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's 10 of us here already. Good Lord. I'm sorry I'm a little late. I struggle to dial in a little. Uh, I just want to see if I can project here so long. Um, I guess it must be very cold where you are, Aaron. It's snowing pretty hard. I just got back from running the kids to school. Let me know when you want to start. Uh, um, I think maybe we can give it one more minute and start at five past, okay. if that's okay with you. Sure, I, I'm in no rush at all. Um, I'm dialed in from one of these Facebook portal devices, which work really well, but which you can't project a screen from. So I'm dialing in another way too. <laughs> and uh, hopefully that will enable me to project a document. Okay, that sounds good. Right, we're, we're looking fairly good so far. <clears throat> Okay, I think we can start whenever you're ready, Quentin. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'm just, uh, maybe you can do an intro so long. All right. Um, I'm um, just going to get the projection working. Yeah. Cool. Um, so today, what we're going to cover is um, we're going to um, do a review of the due diligence guidelines. Um, specifically as, as are you know required as part of the criteria for for projects which are joining um, the CNCF and projects that are um, graduating from from one level to another say from sandbox to incubation for example um, Quinton uh, was uh, as, as well as Aaron I guess were one of the um, original uh, people who put together some of the guidelines and the criteria so, um, it's about as authoritative as it gets, um, and, and hopefully this will be useful. Um, we'll, we'll be sharing this recording, and, and this will be useful for uh, projects looking to to learn more about the the process and the criteria, and and also it will um, be a useful aid for um, tech leads and and other members of the SIGs to that might be involved in due, due, due diligence reviews at different points. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'm just struggling to, oh, here we go. Maybe that will work now. 
give me one second. I was having some permission problems. Ah, there we go. There we go. Uh, can you see my screen? Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as, as Alex mentioned, um, a few of us got together a few years ago and tried to, well, while I was on the TOC at the time, tried to kind of codify some of the um, principles and goals behind these, uh, the admission of projects into and out of this, the CNCF and between the various different levels. Um, I didn't prepare any fancy slides or anything for today. Um, I was thinking it might be more useful just to treat it mostly as a sort of an overview of the process and drive it through Q&A from the audience. Um, so, so this is the document that we wrote some years ago. Um, it, it, first of all, I must mention that I'm no longer on the TOC, so I do not actually officially represent the views of the TOC in this regard. I did write this document and it is kind of the document that the TOC uses. Um, but uh, if there's any contradiction between what I tell you and what the TOC tells you, the TOC uh, takes precedence for sure. And if, if there's anything that I say today that any of you think is uh, contrary to what the TOC might uh, have told you recently, uh, then, then please do bring it up so that I don't confuse people with misleading information. Um, so I think the first thing, and I'm not going to go through all the bullet points, uh, this document, you can see the URL at the top, that's pretty straightforward, um, has links to all of the various bulleted lists of criteria and levels, etc. But I think it's important to understand that, that there are three different levels of, of involvement uh, of projects in the, in the CNCF. I'm sure most of you are familiar with these terms, but it's useful just to recap on what the overall intention of the different levels of, are. So the, the first one is called Sandbox. Um, we have many, many projects in the Sandbox. And uh, for the most part, the Sandbox was explicitly created as an environment for essentially any project, nascent or otherwise, that was looking for a legal home where the IP of the project would be well-defined, where the Linux Foundation or the CNCF uh, within the Linux Foundation would uh, have clear ownership of the IP and that the um, project, so multi-company projects could easily collaborate uh, with a well-defined structure as to, you know, nobody could sue each other afterwards and all that kind of stuff. So. So that was the, the overall goal. Now, what that means is that essentially, if somebody has a good idea and says, I think I've got a good idea and I would like to collaborate with companies X, Y, and Z uh, to figure out whether this good idea can be turned into some kind of useful open source project, that could be a sandbox project. Uh, and so any, any sort of indication that it has to have code that meets certain standards or certain commit rates or anything else are, are I think, misleading. Um, the intention is clearly that these, these sandbox projects either um, gain some momentum, you know, within a reasonable period of time, getting all of the people together to collaborate on this idea or project, or maybe it's already, you know, a, a project that exists that has a bunch of collaborators who are looking for a, a legal home. Um, and and the, the expectation is that it either gains some momentum uh, and, and actually starts happening or it dies. Uh, and and it, by dying, it might be there's no interest in collaborating on this project or not enough interest to actually get a, a viable community around it. Um, or maybe they do get a viable community around it who go and explore the space and decide that it's actually a bad idea and cancel the project. And these are all reasonable and expected uh, potential outcomes of sandbox projects. Of course, another one is that the sandbox project does become something useful that we end up with multiple companies collaborating on a useful thing. Uh, it gets some steam behind it. People contribute. Uh, it starts working. Um, and then at some point it gets starts getting used in production by limited numbers of customers or users. Um, and then we can say, oh, maybe it's actually something that is sort of reaching some point of, you know, 1.0 completion. And, um, and we can consider moving it into the incubation um, 
part of the CNCF, which is a different level. So um, does that make sandbox somewhat clear to people? And feel free, please do interrupt me along the way if anyone has questions. Deathly silence. <laughs> Is I anyone here? That's very clear. I think that's very clear. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so the next level up is is uh, what's called incubation, um, and so again, you can go to the links and you can see there are specific criteria. They're intentionally vague. They are designed so that there is a fair amount of latitude that the TOC has to exercise some judgment on deciding um, whether a given project should enter the incubation uh, lab or not. Oh, oh, one one thing, just to go back to Sandbox for a moment, one thing that's very important is that we do not want to create the impression that by gaining a CNCF badge, a project somehow becomes credible um, as a production worthy use case, um, that it is somehow as good as Kubernetes or as as good as um, any of the other uh, graduated CNCF projects. So we've put some pretty strict ruling and rules around what level of promotion a project may receive within the CNCF when it is in sandbox, because we don't want to create confusion by mixing up these sort of nascent, not yet developed, not yet mature projects with, you know, clearly mature projects like, like uh, Kubernetes. And, and the other graduated projects. So, so uh, there will be no, you know, big banners. There will be no press releases. There will be no, um, you know, socks with with you know sandbox project X on them uh, at the CNCF, uh, at least at KubeCon events um, produced by the CNCF or, or or any of the organization. In to the extent that they are, these are essentially mistakes. Um, the, the intention is very clearly not to promote, to actively market and promote sandbox projects, but rather just create a legal home for them to get started. Um, right, so progressing to the next level, which is um, incubation. These are projects that are, you know, still relatively new. Um, they might be, you know, 1.0 or thereabouts. Um, they have a limited number of users, uh, maybe a few. Uh, who are starting to use them in production. Um, they have an active development community of uh, may even, I think somebody correct me if I'm wrong, it may even be a single company who has got this thing to a point where people are actually using it in production um, in you know, some, albeit some kind of limited form. Um, they may not have all of their T's crossed and all of their I's dotted. They may not have all of the requisite committees in place and all of the requ requisite governance structures in place. Um, they may not have, you know, enormous numbers of users or enormous numbers of contributors, but they do have a, a viable pro product project um, that in the, in the opinion of the CNCF TOC is, is, you know, consistent with the goals of the CNCF um, around cloud native technology. Uh, and which they believe uh, has a potential to become something that, that could get the, the, the real stamp of approval from the CNCF to say this thing you can you know bet your business on, you can run your business on on this project. It's not there yet. It doesn't have all of the, all of the um, things in place that the CNCF would like to have in place to be able to kind of bet long term on a project, but it looks like it's getting there and it's usable in production. Uh, at least with the limited use cases. Um, and I think that is, you know, that is the point at which we do the main bulk of the technical due diligence on projects is when they want to go into this incubation stage. Um, and I'm going to use this as an opportunity to flip through this document quickly to give you an overview of the kinds of things that we want to do during that due diligence. Um, the one that happens, you know, later when a project wants to move from uh, from incubation to to graduation, graduated project is is a lot more lightweight. It's a lot of checkbox items about around legal compliance and do you have a process for this and that and the next thing, uh, and have you got this badge and that badge? All of which are useful things, and I don't want them to sound unimportant, um, but usually when a project transitions from incubation to 
graduation, we're not arguing about whether its architecture is correct or whether it's cloud native or not, or whether it's a good idea or not. Uh, we were usually really checking all the boxes of things that we would expect to have in place in order to say, this is a good long-term bet for you to use in your company uh, and, and run your production software on. Cool, any questions so far? Deathly silence. Okay, please do uh, interrupt me. And in fact, Alex, I'm gonna ask you to like, as a point of uh, just to keep the debate slightly lively, please do ask me questions, even if even if you don't really want to, because um, <laughs> I think it's useful. There, there must <laughs> I will be some, do. Some questions that come, come up along the way. Okay, so, you know, there's, there's a bit of blurb there. Basically, if you're doing a technical due diligence, particularly for, for this uh, CN, uh, uh, CNCF SIG, um, your, your overall role is to try and gather all the information that the TOC would be wanting in order to make a judgment call on whether a project should or should not be uh, either admitted at one of the levels, uh, sandbox, incubation, or graduated, or whether it can um, move from one level to another, sandbox to incubation, incubation to graduation. Um, you know, th there's quite a lot of hard work involved here. Um, you know, it differs depending on the project, but, you know, the intention is particularly for an incubation level application um, that, you know, you should go and look at the source code, you should go and build the software, you should go as, a, as an, uh, ideally an expert in the particular area that the project covers, uh, you should be able to have a, a fairly detailed and informed opinion about the quality of the code, um, the people that are using it, how they are using it, uh, how the software development process works, what kind of testing they have, um, is the code in reasonable quality or not? Are there any people in the open source community that are you know, arguing and fighting about things? Uh, all of these things are, are relevant and, and they're not things that you're going to find by reading the application form that the project filled in uh, to say we want to be in incubation. They actually require you to go kind of behind the scenes, talk to people, look at the code, run the code, try it out, um, you know, go and sort of eavesdrop on a few PRs and a few uh, pieces of, you know, debugging stuff, or if there's a CICD process in place, you know, go and watch it for, for a couple of days and see what stuff's getting merged and what tests fail and what tests exist and where things have to get backed out, why. All of these things are relevant to the, to the health of a project. They don't all have to be perfect, um, but they do have to be, you know, we do have to have visibility into them. Um, so I think that's important to, to note. Um, so the primary goals here are to enable the voting TOC members to cast an informed vote about a project. Um, it's crucial that each member of the TOC is able to form their own opinion as to whether and to what extent the project meet, uh, meets the agreed upon criteria for whatever level it is wanting to enter. As the leader of the due diligence exercise, your job is to make sure that you have whatever, in, that they have whatever information they need succinctly and readily available in order that they can form that opinion. Um, you've probably noticed most of the members of the Technical Oversight Committee, the TOC, are, are you know, very busy people. They're very, very busy people. Well, they're on the TOC because they're typically very good at what they do. They typically have a lot of experience and uh, know a lot of things about cloud native technologies. And those people tend to be given a lot of responsibility in the companies they work for. Uh, and hence they're very busy. So they don't have the time to do all the work that I just outlined to you. So that is the job of the, of the, um, of the uh, SIGs, the SIG. special interest groups. <laughs> I drew a blank there. Um, the special interest groups are there for precisely that reason. One, they're more focused on, on particular areas of expertise. And this one is the, is the storage SIG, of course. Um, so we, we gather, you know, more than one or two people that are very uh, specialized or experts in, in a particular area. Uh, and we do a lot of that heavy lifting work. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the model that is, that is proposed here. Um, 
And there's a whole bunch of bullet points here where you can start to make sure you understand what the TOC principles are, what the project proposal process is, what the graduation criteria are between the various levels, uh, what the desired cloud native properties are. Um, and you know, these are these are pretty foundational things. If you if you're not clear on what those are, then you won't be able to do the due diligence uh, to any degree of uh, usefulness. Um, um, hey, make just, sure you've read the project just, proposal. Just, just as a um, just as background as well, it, it's probably worth noting that the the criteria um, are layered between each of the different um, uh, levels. So you know, it, this kind of um, uh, it's kind of implied that in order to to achieve incubation, for example, you, you will have achieved all of the criteria for sandbox, and and likewise if you. To fully graduate, you you you, you have to be um, you have to have uh, all the criteria for for incubating too. Yeah, yeah, that makes absolute sense. Um, and and there are cer certain things that are kind of inviolate. So so I mean, there are certain principles that apply across all levels, um, and things like cloud native properties. You know, the 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 ability of the system to to um, service its use case in a scalable way on essentially commodity hardware in a cloud computing environment. These are, these are you know, fundamental principles of the CNCF. And so if you come along with a project or if a project comes along and it, and it has a you know, large single point of failure monolithic database in the middle of it, um, it's, it's unlikely, it's not impossible, but it's unlikely that it will fulfill the goals of the CNCF. Um, so, you know, and sometimes you can sort of cut your due diligence exercise a little short if there are obvious flaws in either an existing project or a plan, which make it uh, contrary to the goals of the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, then you can just kind of stop right there and say, look, uh, you know, this is, this looks like a nice project, but it doesn't fit in the CNCF. Um, uh, here's some suggestions as other places you might go to um, with that project or that idea. Does that make sense? And, and the Linux Foundation, by the way, has, has several different foundations within it, uh, which cater to different uh, areas, networking, uh, storage, uh, tel telcos, uh, machine learning, etc. So it may just be that this thing is not, you know, there's nothing wrong with the design of this project. It just doesn't fit into the into the sort of uh, the sphere of the CNCF, and it fits better in some other foundation, either within the Linux Foundation or outside. And and hopefully we will be able to guide you in that direction. Um, yeah, I I I, th okay, I think so, that's that 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 point is 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 a is a particularly good point because I think. We've we've seen that um, we've seen that happen a few times. In fact, um, when the TOC have been voting on on sandbox projects or questions that have come through um, from from the TOC on on incubating projects as well. So so I think you know this is it it, it is a, a good point to um, to obviously not join the CNCF just for the sake of joining the CNCF. It it, it needs to be a good fit as well. Yeah, that's true. And, and actually, maybe this is a good time to just have a slight kind of diversion. So one of one sort of syndrome I've seen uh, a few times, or more than once at least, um, is that, the, you know, KubeCon in particular, you know, obviously less so now that it's virtual, but, but hopefully we will resolve that at some point. But KubeCon in particular and the CNCF in general has been an incredibly successful vehicle for promoting uh, open source projects. Uh, arguably, you know, the most successful vehicle available to any open source project, uh, provided that it fits into this space. And, and you know, the whole cloud native space, as, as all of you are aware, is, you know, on everybody's tongues. So, so there's, a, there's a very strong motivation for open source projects to be seen to be strongly affiliated with the CNCF for a purely marketing and promotional point of view. It's a very good brand, it's a very strong brand, uh, and, and a lot of companies and, and open source projects see a lot of benefit in, in 
coming to the CNCF and becoming part of the CNCF family of projects. On the flip side, uh, the CNCF is, is really trying to create um, a foundation or is, has created a foundation um, to a greater or lesser extent, which, which helps the consuming uh, environment of the people using and wanting to use cloud native technology to provide them with a, with a sane structure of projects where they can easily understand what is what, why these projects exist, how they fit together, whether they interoperate properly, et cetera. And so sometimes those two goals are at odds. Um, sometimes a given project may not actually fit into the sort of clarified vision of cloud native computing that, that the foundation tries to create for consumers so that they can understand what's going on. Uh, in other cases, some of the projects are just not mature enough. So, so to create the impression that project X is usable in production um, when in fact it's not, and, and people may try it out and find out, oh, wow, it's got a whole bunch of limitations that weren't documented and now I'm having a bad experience and now CNCF, you've, you've made my life difficult. So, so there's this, this kind of tension between these two and, and to a large extent, this due diligence exercise is designed to resolve that tension um, and, and try at, at the very least to clearly explain to projects why they may not at this time fit within the CNCF well um, or advise them as to what they could do to change things. And in some cases, these are just, you know, honest errors where they made either architectural choices or uh, choices in how they run their project or whether they collaborate with other companies or how they deal with them um, that make it difficult to fit into the CNCF. And they're like, oh, wow, that's great advice. We're going to change that and we'll come back in six months time and, and then we'll fit in. Um, and uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll stop babbling on about that. But just to point out that there is, there is a bit of a tension there and, and, and part of the due diligence exercise is to try and resolve that tension. Um, so here's a bunch of questions. I'm just going to rattle through them. This is going to be kind of boring, but hopefully it will trigger some conversation and questions um, because these are the explicit questions that you should be asking yourself and noting the answers to as part of your due diligence exercise. Is there an architectural uh, diagram, uh, feature overview? Um, can people you know, with a diagram understand, oh, this is what this project does? Um, what are the primary use cases um, and which of them are accomplishable now? You know, sometimes there are use cases that are envisaged for the future, but the project is not ready to service them today. Uh, which of them can be accomplished with reasonable additional effort uh, and are perhaps even already planned on the roadmap. They'll be delivered in later this year or whatever the case may be. And which of them are explicitly out of scope? Um, so it's entirely possible that you have a, you know, a data distribution system that that is specifically designed for particular use cases, either rate of churn of the data or size of the data or whatever. Um, but you know, distributing large blobs is is explicitly out of scope. Or distributing things that have you know millions of subscribers who want to know when the data has changed. That's just not part of the design of the project. So it's as important to understand what's in scope as what is out of scope. Um, and, and make sure that these things are clear, because if somebody wants to use, you know, a key value to store to distribute their movies, uh, it's probably not going to work very well. And sometimes that's not obvious when you read the marketing blurb around a project. It sounds like it, it's just awesome for everything. <clears throat> uh, what exactly are the current performance, scalability and resource consumption bounds of the software? So do, do the, does the project actually understand exactly at what point the software breaks? either uh, performance-wise, scalability-wise, or resource consumption-wise? And have they actually been tested? So if they claim this thing scales up to millions of rows of data or whatever the metric is, like has anyone actually tested that and proved that to be the case? Uh, many of you might remember that Kubernetes in the early days only actually scaled to like 100 nodes. Um, and it took a very, very long time, many, many years, to get it to even a few thousand nodes. And, uh, and those limits were empirically derived by actually doing tests on some of the stuff. And I don't know where it stands at the moment. I'm guessing it's in the sort of 5,000 node region, but I'm not sure. Um, 
but th there's an example of, of, of that kind of thing. Uh, what exactly are the failure modes? You know, what, what, what happens when things fail? Some, some architectures fail catastrophically. You know, if you have a single point of failure database and it goes down <clears throat> and you have no mirrors and no caching, um, the system is typically completely down. Uh, if, however, you have, you know, replicated sharded system, uh, it may degrade in performance, you know, in a somewhat more graceful manner. How well understood are these failure modes? Um, and, and you can enumerate them, you know, what happens when this kind of node fails? What happens when that kind of node fails? What happens when this overloads, when the network becomes unavailable? All these kind of things. Does it fail gracefully or does it collapse in a heap and corrupt all the data? There, there are very big differences there. Um, what explicit trade-offs have been made? Um, you know, very often it's... Quentin, yeah, uh, yeah. Just, just, just on that point, um, I think that's, that's also a brilliant place um, to, when you're doing DD, to, um, to actually investigate for yourself, um, because it, it, it does give you insights into the, um, looking at the failure modes and, and just trying failing uh, components of the system, etc., actually does give you a really good insight into the overall architecture um, of the, of the yes. project as well. So it, it's, it's generally a really good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one tension you'll find that there's a lot of, if you want to do all of this stuff yourself um, manually, it, it's a lot of work. Um, and so quite often what I end up doing is going to speak to the project architects or the, the you know, the leaders of the project and get a sense of whether they've thought about these things. If they can give me reasonable answers, yes, we've tried that um, and this is what happens or we haven't tried that, but but the architecture tells me that it that it would do the following. Um, th that's often a good enough answer. Uh, if the project leaders have not even thought about these things, then that's more of a red light to me because that indicates that they designed the thing without even thinking about what the failure modes would be. And that often means that they're pretty bad. Um, and that's, you know, again, it's not your choice to, it's not your place in life to decide whether a given uh, architectural design is good enough. It's really your place in life to, to expose the details to the TOC in such a way that they can consume them and perhaps give advice. Um, you know, this thing looked very good to me. This thing seemed like it needed some improvement in these areas uh, is, the, is, is kind of the mode of communication that I would recommend. Um, Trade-offs around performance, scalability, complexity, reliability, security, et cetera. Um, you know, there it's it's almost impossible to build a system that is, you know, infinitely performant, infinitely scalable, uh, very simple, highly reliable, and fully secure. Uh, it just doesn't exist. So inevitably, explicit trade-offs need to be made. We decide that we're going to make the system more complex in order to make it more secure, maybe. Uh, or hopefully less complex to make it more secure. Um, we we trade off um, you know performance for reliability. That's a that's a pretty classic kind of trade off. So certain kinds of performance, uh, you know, central centralized single point failure relational databases are actually very fast. Uh, you can do you know amazing numbers of transactions per second per node on those things. They just you know when they fall over they fall over. And so, so there's an explicit trade-off that often gets made. People use less performant databases, for example, um, to get better reliability, um, et cetera. Um, what are the most important holes uh, in the project? Like, do they know that they have no uh, extensibility or integration points or that they don't have a very good high availability story at the moment? Um, Sometimes knowledge of these things, particularly at the incubation level, um, is, is good enough. You know, we, we, we know we have this shortfall, we're working on it, that's part of our incubation efforts. Uh, it's still usable in production, but there is this, you know, theoretical failure mode that we don't like and we're working on solving that. What does the quality of the code look like? Uh, yeah. Uh, just a, a question before you, you move on from those last two. Um, those are common kind of backlog or issues that a, a good healthy project keeps visible uh, to all players. So is the check mark saying that there's some architects that know what those trade-offs and holes are, or is the check mark saying 
the project is is good in giving visibility to all those involved of what those are that's a that's a very good question um, and first of all there's no checkbox um, and secondly it depends very much on what what level we're talking about here um, you know if 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 a project wanting to graduate uh, has uh, an obvious single point of failure that is not you know at the very least made highly visible in big flashing letters on the front page of the product project um, then you know it's it's almost definitely not going to graduate um, even at incubation level uh, you would definitely want that stuff made visible. Um, clearly, anyone wanting to use the system should know what the restrictions are and what risks they're placing themselves under in terms of availability or performance. So, the, the you know, to, to the extent that there is a checkbox, it's exposing the stuff. And then it's up to the TOC to decide, okay, we, we tell potential users of this open source project what these limitations are, are those reasonable limitations? Is the project still useful? Uh, are they solvable problems, etc.? Does that does that answer your question, Tom? I think you you're, you're, the answer is it's it's subjective based on which which gate they're going through. Yes, it, it is definitely the case that being clear about what the limitations are is is very important and it may be fine to not solve the limitations, provided that there are workarounds or use cases where those limitations do not uh, create a huge problem. It's not the case that every project has to work in every single use case uh, perfectly, but it does need to at least work in some use cases well enough. Make sense? Yeah. Ag ag agreed. And some of the most successful projects I've seen are the ones that do a good job of deciding what they're not going to do. Um, and, exactly. And so uh, it, I guess I'm just curious on how the CN CF and storage SIG can help uh, present a, 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 a best practice kind of idea of taking these concepts and modeling what is good healthy examples of giving you know making those visible to all the developers and contributors and users yeah that that's very good feedback and i don't think we've necessarily tackled that specifically alex correct me if i'm wrong we have the white paper which i think does a pretty good job of outlining um the sort of the space of storage and the kinds of failures and the kinds of areas that one needs to think about. Um, but I think we could kind of distill that into, you know, what, what you've kind of referred to as a bit of a checklist uh, or maybe the specific answers to, to these particular questions per project. And that, to some extent, that's what the due diligence report is supposed to be, is to take all of, all of the kinds of things that people might care about and create explicit answers to them. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, make, yep, thanks. Cool. Uh, okay, so Alex, how much time do I have? Do, do, do we want to cover anything else in this meeting or should I just carry on waffling? Um, no, we have about 20 minutes left. Okay, cool. I, I will try and step it up a little bit. Um, you know, code quality is pretty uh, self-explanatory, uh, but of course, you know, just to state the obvious, uh, if, if your code quality is pretty bad at the beginning, it, it typically doesn't get worse. Uh, it, it doesn't get better, it gets worse. So if you have a project that has like horrendous code quality at the beginning, uh, then you should raise that as a big red flag. Uh, particularly, you know, poor choices of language, languages that don't scale well. Uh, if you don't think that it's possible to kind of move from a point where the project is to, to graduation ever without, you know, rewriting the whole project, then that would be a pretty big red flag. Uh, and there are a couple of languages, I won't diss any in particular, but there are a couple of languages, there, there are actually, you know, major open source projects that have failed because of relatively simple things like, like choosing the wrong language for the particular project they were doing and running into a wall where it just could not scale to the, the size of a project, not so much scale in terms of performance of software, but just scale in terms of the size of the project that, that they were 
planning to build and the size of the teams and, and the language may just not lend itself to large projects like that. Um, dependencies, uh, this is a pretty big one, you know, make sure you understand what this thing needs in order to work correctly or well. Uh, and make sure that you understand what uh, how, how these dependencies couple with the system uh, and what their license restrictions may be. You don't have to be a licensing expert, um, but, but if this thing can't run without some proprietary thing that you have to go and buy from somebody, then that's a pretty big red flag. Or if it is, uh, can't run unless you, you know, cut and paste some code from something into somewhere, that's obviously uh, a concern. Um, what is the release model? Do they have like proper versioning? Do, do they do periodic releases? Uh, do we have like CICD systems, uh, continuous integration, continuous development uh, system, uh, sorry, deployment systems? So, so is there automated testing whenever anybody sends a diff? Uh, does it uh, get tested and merged if, if appropriate and caught if it doesn't work properly, et cetera? These are all important. It's not the case that every single project has to have them right from the beginning, um, but certainly once you get to incubation, you want to have a, a reasonable CI CD system and decent uh, automated testing. Um, the CNCF staff have lots of uh, lawyers and, and uh, licensing experts. So you, as I said, you don't have to be a licensing expert yourself, but you do need to at least have a, a rough overview of what, what the licensing uh, requirements are for the CNCF and and what projects the pro this particular project uh, depends on and how exactly they're integrated. Um, do we import their code? Do we just install that thing before installing the project, etc. Um, operational modes. Um, so that's that's mostly technical stuff. Um, any I just, uh, about that could I just um... Yeah. I, I, I was I was just going to add uh, sort of a couple of points because over, over the last um, over the last year, for example, at least you know since since I've been involved in a number of different projects, um, you know, two two recurring um, uh, things that 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 come up um, fairly often are um, the licensing. So you know, it's uh, and, and, and the licensing sort of applies from sandbox and above. So, so it's 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 useful to familiarize yourself with the with the CNCF IP policy, um, and uh, and understand you know which which classes of licenses are are you know an easy slam dunk and and, and which others cause problems. So, so so that's definitely um worth considering. Um, the other thing that's worth considering is is the dependencies. So so this has often come up you know partly you know as as um, as Quinton mentioned. If uh, you know maybe there are dependencies on on proprietary um, products or something like that, but but also you know we've had um, circumstances where where questions have been raised about um, dependencies um, on products which which effectively um, might might uh, compromise some of the cloud native um, aspects of of the product. So so for example, you know you you, you might um, you might have um, uh, you might have a project which which is um, scalable and it's you know it, it, it scales horizontally and, and has multiple nodes and, and that sort of thing but but for example you know depends on a single postgres database in the in the background right and 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 then you, you know you have to you have to ask some of those questions about how um, you know what what options are available for for making those those aspects of the system highly available or, or, or scalable for example um, and, and that's that's um, that 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 comes up more often than, than you'd imagine. Yeah, makes sense. I agree. So moving on to the sort of more projecty project management side of of these projects. So moving away from the purely technical stuff. Um, you know, do we have good documented processes? How do people who want to get involved in the project figure out what they have to do? Uh, is there an issue tracking process? You know, most of these things with people using things like GitHub, 
Um, most of these things get checkboxes pretty quickly, um, but things like release management are not always as obvious. Um, and so it's a good idea to understand what's going on. They don't all have to be perfect. And, and I want to be very clear about this. It's not the case that if you if you get a cross next to one of any one of these items, you somehow not eligible to enter the CNCF. That's not the intention at all. We just want to understand what goes on there and, and what things, if any, need to be changed. Um, and what the, what the current status is and what plans there might be for improving the current status. Um, is there a documented governance model of any kind? Now, you know, for, for incubation, this is quite often the case that it's not, there is not such a thing. Uh, and, and Kubernetes didn't have one until, you know, much later on. Um, and that was one of the things that sort of held up its graduation. So, so you don't have to have an answer yes to all of these questions, but you do need to know what the answer is. Is there a code of conduct? Does it have a license? Uh, which licenses? Is there a like automated way of checking whether the people who contribute to the project uh, fulfill those uh, or, or agree to those license restrictions? Uh, what is the quality of communication around the project? So usually projects have you know Slack channels and GitHub issues and PR reviews and whatever. Uh, is is the quality of communication good? Do people respect each other? Do people respond to things when they get uh, reported, etc.? Or uh, are people having flame wars uh, in their PR reviews? Um, or are they just leaving, you know, reported issues to rot for months on end? On end? All those kinds of things. Um, what does the core team look like? Who are the people behind this thing? You know, how committed are they? Are they you know, somebody who works after midnight for an hour once a month on a project or are these like, you know, professional people who are paid as their full time job to build and maintain this project. There's a, there's a big difference between the two. Um, are there any areas that are lacking leadership? You know, maybe you have a good technical person who doesn't have good project management skills running the project. Maybe you have a good project manager who doesn't have good technical skills. Maybe uh, there are other areas that might be lacking. Maybe they don't have the right skills around testing or release management. Uh, maybe they need some help there. In some cases, the CNCF can help there. In other cases, we can, uh, you know, sort of help the project identify areas that, where they might be weak and, and where they might uh, want to recruit some people, um, etc. Right. Um, any questions around project type items, uh, project management, etc. Users, um, very important to understand who uses the project. Um, try and speak to people who are using it and get an understanding. You know, sometimes it's quite often the case that you know everybody wants to claim that all the big famous companies are using their projects, uh, their, their software. So you'll see you know screens with lots of visible logos of you know whether it's, I don't want, I don't even want to mention any brand names, but you know the ones I'm talking about makes it sound impossible, uh, uh, sound impressive if, if these big names are using your software. Now, there's a very big difference between, you know, some intern at that company kind of like installed the software once versus um, the business runs on it. Um, and, and getting an understanding of, of, of exactly what the use cases are that the stuff is really being used for at the moment and talking to the people using it is very important. Um, also, all projects have both strengths and weaknesses. Um, so so if, if you get a bunch of people telling you that everything is awesome and it's perfect and it changed their lives, it's probably not true. All projects have strengths and weaknesses and you need to understand both of them. Um, there's also you know, a huge amount of viral marketing out there around projects. And so your job is to actually cut through all of that stuff. Anybody can read all the buzz and the Twitter feeds and everything else about a project. That's not actually the information that is useful in deciding uh, whether a project is uh, well used, whether, whether it is technically sound or whether uh, users of it uh, like the project for, for the right reasons. Um, so it's very important to kind of cut through all the hype and, and get an understanding of, of what's really going on there. Um, and I think, you know, most of the remaining stuff hopefully is fairly self-explanatory, you know, contributors on the project should be welcome, feel welcomed. Um, there should be reasonable onboarding procedures where people who want to contribute can. Um, sometimes useful to understand, you know, how this project came to be. Um, one, again, one sort of um, 
syndrome that I have seen is that uh, some projects originate inside often big companies. They sounded like a good idea or somebody got excited about something and created some project in a company. And then they basically didn't find any users for it, didn't find any use cases or customers. And the thing kind of languished around for a few years. And now they want to donate it to the CNCF to get some kind of good karma press or something. And, and it's important to kind of spot those. You know, if a project has been around, even if it's only applying to be in the sandbox, which doesn't have any strong requirements for, you know, heavy use or, or stability or anything. But if a project's been around for five years and allegedly people have been working on for five years and, and it still doesn't have any users, um, you should ask some pretty, you know, pointed questions about why have you got no users? Um, you know, is there something wrong with the software? Is it a use case that, that is not important to people? You thought that there was a need for this thing that nobody actually turns out to need? Um, th those are questions well worth asking. You don't have to be rude and you don't have to be, um, you know, disrespectful in any way, but they're definitely questions that need, that need answers. And don't be shy to just keep asking until you get the answers you're looking for, or, or at least um, sufficiently in-depth answers. Uh, and sometimes you won't. Sometimes people won't be able to give you the answer. And, and in that case, that, that, that is an answer in itself. Um, if people can't explain to you why they have no users after five years, then, then probably this is not a project that's going to thrive in CNCF. Right. Um, on, um, on, your point, on your point about users, yeah. um, so we were just accepted into the sandbox yesterday, um, the Pervega project. And right. um, one thing that kind of became important to us, even though we started with an incubation application, but um, whether we skipped over this definition or... Uh, or the definition clarified itself in the intervening months. Um, but at the different stages, you know, the types of users are important. So for us as a vendor, you know, our, um, our customers weren't necessarily um, end users according to, to definitions. So um, anyway, that's, a, I think, an important thing for projects to understand at the, at the various levels, um, the definitions of vendors and, uh, not, not necessarily being users and their customers not necessarily being users. And what you're really looking for is like open oh, source that... users. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just, yeah, just, just, just to clarify on that point, just, just to clarify on that point, I think what's, what's important is that um, there are production users of the, the open source project as it's been submitted. Um, right. So, you know, if, if for example, the, the production users are only using um, a commercial version of the projects that includes components that aren't available in the open source version, for example, um, those users probably wouldn't qualify as, as, as necessarily as, as end users of the, of the open source project, like, like as what happened in Proviga. But I think, I think we can, we can probably look forward to, to remedying that um, yeah. During a I mean, I think we're, yeah, I think we're happy about it, but, uh, but, but yeah, the, these transitive users, uh, you know, it's, it's good, I think, to, to understand that. And uh, just to, to clarify your point, Derek, um, was, was your point that sometimes the people using the software are not what we would term end users. They might be vendors themselves or integrators or, or whatever the case may be. Was that your point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that as well as, um, you know, you can have really solid production use, but maybe not, but maybe that doesn't qualify as, as open source end users. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's actually perhaps a point worth expounding upon. Um, you know, open source window dressing is not what we're after here. And I, I, to be clear, I'm not accusing you or your company of this, and I, I wasn't actually involved in that due diligence at all. But, but I have seen it before where, you know, a small little sliver of a big commercial project is open sourced, and, and maybe even it has the, you know, community edition label on it or something, uh, but is, is, you know, 
not very useful in practice or in production. And in order to, to use this thing in any kind of reasonable production environment, you have to go and buy the commercial license with a whole bunch of add-ons that you, you know are not open source. That, that's not a model that we're promoting here. The, the open source components, the stuff that, that lives within the CNCF should itself be a viable production Nizable, productionized system. Uh, by all means, there can be commercial add-ons and, and proprietary additions, but the core thing that is open sourced in the CNCF should itself be useful in production. Make yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think on our side, somehow we um, we kind of overlooked these these definitions. Um, and and so. that's a good point. We should we should. Uh, we should clarify that, Alex. Maybe if we, if you can make a note, um, and we can, we can make sure that that's because because that is a recurring. We've seen that more than once. Let's put it that way. That that confusion. Right. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, software companies' business models are kind of built around this. Uh, I forget exactly what the the commonly used term is, but you know, there's a community edition or an open source part of it, and then there's a bunch of commercial stuff that's addable onto it. Uh, open core, I guess, is the term. Um, right. And that's that's quite common, and and it can confuse people. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with you know open core where where the part that is open source is only usable to like kick the tires and play with. Uh, but that's not the intention of the CNCF. The CNCF right. is is open source projects that can be used in production at scale. Right. Well, yeah. In our, in our case, we want the open core to kind of compete with the with the product. You know. So uh, yeah, we're we're Happy to be here, eager to get going. Cool. I thought that was and welcome. Pointing out. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Cool. I think we're pretty much out of time, so maybe I should stop waffling now. Uh, you can read the rest of the document um, and feel free to discuss on the Slack channel or um, feel free to email me. If you Google me, I'm sure you can find my contact details um, or ask on the Slack channel. And uh, happy to answer any questions offline. Any further questions before we wrap up? Hi, yes. Um, so this is Yanis. So I just want to say that we might need for... Uh, so I'm from the other side, the ones that didn't get in on the sandbox. So congratulations to yeah. Pavega, right? Uh, so I think we might need some more clarifications about um, what is the bar exactly for entry in sandbox in terms of uh, adoption and uh, project maturity right because so from the criteria uh, for sandbox right i see that is um, uh, to encourage public visibility of experiments or other early work right but pravega doesn't look to me uh, like um as an example right it doesn't look like a project that it was an experiment or something right it looks like a proper company to me right so it's uh, it's a bit mixed i think the messaging that we get Right, so mm -hmm. that that is my take on that. We might need to highlight a bit more. What are they? What is the bar exactly for sandbox project in in those terms? Right, um, adoption, uh, community adoption, and uh, maturity. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good point you make, um, and I think I touched on that earlier, which is that sandboxes, and and I don't think the CNCF documentation is is does any helps to clarify some of this confusion but my personal opinion is and i was involved in actually like concocting the sandbox uh, when i was in the trc my personal opinion is that the sandbox is is intentionally a vague space it's a space where somebody's looking for a legal home where they can collaborate with other companies safely uh, that may be experimental that may actually be a project that has been around forever and which now is being open sourced and they want to collaborate with other companies. So it's, it's not strictly speaking experimental. Experimental is one of the use cases, but there are many others. Uh, all it really means is that it is not yet, uh, does not qualify for sandbox and many projects go straight from, so, sorry, does not yet qualify for, for incubation. Um, many projects skip sandbox and go straight to incubation. But there are, you know, a bunch of uh, requirements for that, like multiple production use cases and mm -hmm. etc. And some companies, some projects do not yet fulfill those. 
So, so yeah. just uh, if you if you look on the so, so if someone doesn't know that right and goes and sees you know what is the criteria for the sandbox project and what is the goal right? I noticed that you're focusing more on the legal aspect. Why the? I mean, what what I see on the CNCF website right is that this the CNCF sandbox has four goals. One, encourage public visibility of experiments. Right. So. If, if mm -hmm. it's not the case, I mean, it's fine, right? It just needs to be yeah. uh, clarified. Yeah, that's one, that's one of the goals. That doesn't mean that all projects that go in the sandbox have to be experiments. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right. Thank What's you so one much, thing that might be for... worth... Oh, sorry. Sorry, go on. I was just saying, one thing that might be worth avoiding, or at least this is a perception I have of Apache a little bit, is like sometimes Apache is a place for projects to go to die and um, yeah I don't know that we you know this the I don't know that CNCF is risking any of that but um, you did mention that you know maybe an experiment in the sandbox doesn't work out but, but the, the Apache attic is almost bigger than you know the Apache <laughs> roster and I've been excited about a lot of projects that like joined Apache and then failed and I, I wonder I wonder CNCF's yeah. perception of that yeah, we do. We do have, uh, and we should probably wrap up now because we're out of time. Yeah, sorry. But um, we do have uh, a good conversation. We we do have processes for archiving projects explicitly. You know, some projects do die, and then that's kind of reasonable as long as they're flagged accordingly and they're they're not uh, presented in the same kind of light as as thriving projects. I think that's fine. Um, and, and all of these, there are sort of very vague guidelines around timelines, you know, pe uh, projects cannot sit in, in uh, sort of limbo forever. Uh, I think it's reasonable for a project to kind of get stalled temporarily, maybe companies change direction and new open source contributors need to be uh, sort of engaged in the project to get it going again, but it can't just sort of sit there forever in limbo. Uh, then, then it it will either get archived or or removed from the CNCF, and and there are processes for that. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. I have to run. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Uh, I enjoyed it, uh, and uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll have some more in the future. I hope it was useful. Thanks, everyone. All right. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.